Hi, Nairi. Bye, Nairi. <laughs> oh, I can't unmute. Hi. There we go. I'll mute myself again now. Very good. I think there's a couple more people, James, but you can just kick off now. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> just clear my throat. So thank you everyone who's been able to join. So my name is James Brooks. I'm the head of projects here at the startupfactory.tech. And today uh, the webinar is all about the expectation and reality of building your MVP. Now, a lot of people have got preconceptions of MVPs and there's a lot of people doing a lot of very good things. So who am I to actually tell you anything about what you should and shouldn't be doing? So I've worked with software companies for the last eight to nine years, focusing mainly on startups. And the majority of my role is really focusing on what are the key values and benefits of what you're doing, helping you interact with developers, because a lot of times it can be difficult, and really helping to define your MVP, working with companies as far back in my career as working with people like Money Supermarket, through to working with startups for the last seven or eight years while I'm the head of projects. So without telling everyone how to suck eggs and what an MVP is, I'm going to go over what an MVP actually is. So it's obviously consists of three main constituent parts. Um, I've, blogs have been done on this, and I think it's just good to cover it mainly for anchoring the thinking that we're going to do throughout this webinar. So the first is minimum. We all know what minimum is. It's the smallest possible thing that we can actually build. Viable, making sure that it's actually capable of working. And I think the key word in this definition here is adequately to provide a minimum level of value. And product, which is always the most important one, something which is designed and manufactured and refined enough to be sold or to be used by your users, depending on how your business model works. So it's very straightforward when you actually start thinking about it. And when we actually work with our founders, um, there are sometimes some conflicts between the thinking in terms of where the actual boundaries for minimum and viable sit. But we'll go into that more throughout this session. So generally speaking, why are we actually doing an MVP? So a lot of times people are starting out and it works, works for existing businesses as well, but especially in the startup world, investors really want to see some traction. Now to put that into some sort of context, that might be a number of views on boarded. It might be revenue generated. It can really vary depending from investor to investor, but really what they want to see is the following things. They want to see that what your solution is and what your MVP has done has actually solved the problem that you were aiming to solve from the outset. And that problem solution fit is always something which we really emphasize here at TSF for making sure what you've actually done has matched the initial goals. And then, like we said already, this has to be a product. Is there actually a market for your solution? Is it a big enough problem for people to actually want this? If it's five minutes every month, people probably don't want this. If it's five minutes a day and you actually add that up and quantify that over a week, a month, a year, there's probably quite a large market for this. And something that's often forgotten is actually proving the founder fit within this. A lot of times with founders that we've seen and we've worked with, the problem is a good one. The solution is great. 
But why are you the person to take this forward? Because especially at this very early stage, especially with investors, as much as they're investing in the product, they're actually investing in you. So really thinking about why is it that you're the right person to take this startup forward and to solve this problem? You then shape, you prove your business model alongside that because that's your, pro that's your solution market fit. And the whole point really is managing risk. Something we do at TSF and how our model works in terms of we split bills 50-50 and work on half of that being sweat equity is it helps to manage your risk. Let's face it, building an MVP is expensive and it's hard. So how can we reduce the cost, reduce the time, get you into market earlier? How can we manage all of those risks in the best way possible for both yourselves as founders, for us and your investor and prove out as much of your business model and your product as possible? And that's why people do MVPs. It's that straightforward. And really, when you start getting to the nitty gritty, everything is always about managing risk and making sure that the bets you're putting on have got the best chance of succeeding. Because let's face it, we all know what the stats are in terms of startup failure. So how do we make sure we're on the right side of that? Now, when we're going through this and when we start discussing MVPs, I think there is, like I said, some conflict at times, especially between the minimum and the viable. And you get to these misconceptions around what an MVP needs to do, because let's face it, a lot of times your MVP is the first version of your product and your product is your baby. And you want everything to be there. You want everything to work. You want everything to be great. So you want your MVP to showcase everything that your product can do. You want to show the baby walking. You want to show it talking and giggling and laughing and having all the emotions. But equally, you want the MVP to make sure it works. And this is almost leaning into the viability aspect. You want to show it's slick. It, everything works in the back end. Uh, billing systems are all there, you know, just automatic billing people every month. And it's great. And the most important misconception i've seen with start founders is they want the mvp to be perfect now there's a whole raft of things that go around this but when you boil down what the misconceptions are for an mvp it usually fits down to business automations having every feature that you need even at a base level you want everything to be there and when you come to reality and as reed hoffman said once if you're proud of your MVP, you've waited too long. And it's one of the core problems that we see with startups and founders we work with is, and it's a question that I answer most days, if it just did this, it'd be great for release. If it just did this, it'd be great for this customer. Your MVP doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't matter that the your kid can't walk yet or... All they're doing is gaggling and blurbing out noises. It's still cute. But you really need to focus on some key tenets of what your product is. You really want to focus on your core customer journey. What is that one customer who's going to sign the paycheck? Make sure it works for them. And equally, you can have as many manual steps to actually get the business off as early as possible. We've had founders come to us where everything's been built in something like Bubble. And everything in the back end, their magical matching AI, is actually just them. They're moving things on spreadsheets. They're contacting people manually. They're billing people manually. There's a whole raft of things which you can do manually. And it might be that actually that takes some time away from doing sales. But actually, when you are trying to prove that core journey and that core business model, actually get make it work for 10 people, send them an invoice at the end of every month. That can be manual because one thing with your MVP and something that people sometimes forget is that this is something you will iterate on. Sometimes if you use tools like Bubble, it might be something that's throw away. But if you're having an MVP built and it's more bespoke, uh, people like ourselves, or the, if you've got your own team who've started to develop it, you they can iterate on this. They can add additional features very quickly, but make sure you've got your core journey 
and make sure that you are building what needs to be there and take some manual steps because eventually you can plug in something like a zero or a QuickBooks to be able to do your automatic invoicing. You can add in automations. You can even get to the stage where you're plugging in AI components to be able to then take away some of that burden and give you the time to be able to address other parts of the business. But in that initial stage where you're looking for funding and you're building your MVP, really focusing on the reality of what you need and getting it out as soon as possible. I can't count how many times I've been to conferences or spoken to clients. And the main piece of advice, the main takeaway is always get out of the building. And this counts at multiple stages, whether it's right at the start and going and speaking to people about your idea, hammering the streets with a billboard and asking for advice, when you're building it and testing it, and when it's eventually released, do everything as early as possible. Get that feedback because the earlier it is, the quicker, the easier, and the cheaper it is to change things. Once you've released, and in terms of reputation, once you've released, it's okay. You can add more features, you can change things, but the earlier you get it, the more likely these changes will actually match the market in which you're going into. So these are the realities and the misconceptions that we see commonly when it comes to actually looking at MVPs. So something that a lot of people do will talk about this and there's lots of things going wrong and you can do things differently. And a lot of times I don't see people suggesting how. So this is how we actually do it at TSF. So anyone who works with us we do a scoping session, which is a three to four hour session. There's lots of post-it notes on the walls. There's lots of drawing. Hence, we've got so many whiteboards. And I often think that a lot of our team would actually be graffiti artists if they weren't developers. So the first thing we look at is our mission statement and vision statement. Now, they can be slightly different. And we'll go into a little bit more, especially when we start to drill down. But what we really want at this stage is to know about your business and your the big overarching mission statement. What's the inspiration for this? Your vision of this is going to be the number one go-to tool for recruiters in the future. This is going to be the most used platform in legals because it does something different. And how are you going to do it? You're going to do it by addressing this one key problem. And it can be a mission statement, a problem statement, there's lots and lots and lots of ways of doing that. But when we actually get down to the MVP and you've still got that big binding mission statement, how do you actually get to an MVP? Because if you want to build that, it could be millions in, in terms of investment. Can't pretend otherwise, especially if you start looking at your bleeding edge techs and more and more people looking at chat, chat GTP, how can we use AI to prove out some of the problems that we're working with? Or how can we do X? Does X even work in this way? Can technology actually solve this problem at the moment? Chat GTP, for example, you know, they'll be releasing new versions soon. They've just released Chat GTP 4. It improves the functionality. Does it have the functionality yet to achieve what you want? Can blockchain do this? Do you need blockchain? So we distill that into what is your MVP goal? Why are you actually building this? Is it, like I said, are you trying to test your bleeding edge technology? It actually works and can do what you need to do. Are you actually trying to onboard users? Sometimes marketplaces, you may just want to show you've generated 2,000 users. And we've had startups come to us with that, and it's a great metric to show that you're getting traction linking it back to what we'd talk about with investors. Are you actually trying to generate revenue? Is that what your investors want to see? In which case, are your core users going to have to go through this? And they're going to have to, you're going to have to integrate with Stripe or you're going to send them an invoice. And are they going to pay it? And one of the key things with MVP, and it almost links back to smart goals and, you know, there's many a webinar and blog on that if you want to know what they are. Can you actually measure this? Can you quantify if it's worked or not? Actually, when you I want to generate revenue off my MVP, how much revenue? Is this 
we're looking at onboarding a thousand users. Well, you probably don't need to with your MVP. Actually, I want 10 paying customers on this. Much better, much more achievable, much more measurable. And I want these in six months. Great, you've got the time bound element. So you're really starting to narrow in on what's the purpose of the MVP, which is something that a lot of startups can struggle with this because they want to generate revenue. They want to onboard users. They want to test the tech. Now, if you're trying to do a lot of different things, actually is achieving is actually achieving two out of these three goals enough? Now, you are going to get to situations where there are some things that you can't have really MVP and it needs to do everything. An air traffic control system can't really have an MVP. It just needs to work. If you can't track planes and get them to land safely, then it's failed. There's not really an MVP within that. But typically, focusing on what your investors and your users want to see, you can quite easily get to a stage and try and constrict what your MVP is going to do. And once we've done that, this provides our anchor throughout the whole three to four hours. And I've had sessions where this has actually taken the founders two hours to do. So there's nothing wrong in taking your time and doing this. There's nothing wrong in really getting into the nitty gritty of actually, do we need to test the AI works? Can I just do that manually? But we can still get people to pay and eventually the AI frees up your time in future iterations. Actually, do we even need to generate revenue? If we can show that we can onboard a thousand users in Manchester, we can show what our plans are for monetization and that's then a stronger case going to your investors that you've got these thousand users and the reason you want the cash is to be able to actually start to monetize these people and you can have your different strategies and looking more at revenue actually i'm going to use a freemium model i'm going to start looking at what well, we've got a free tier and we want to upgrade 10 percent of our users onto a paying tier and i can't i've not seen the numbers for slack but that's a great i it's a great example of how you can use a freemium model for something which a lot of people use and then upgrade it. Zoom is another one that's very tall we're using now. Zoom for the most for the most part is free, but actually we're going to put some slight restrictions on that and get people to upgrade. And actually we just want 10 percent of that doing this. It proves our business model. You then say that's your investor. Look, we've proved our business business model, the MVP. Please give me the million quid to be able to do X, Y, and Z. So I think it's always really, really important for you to focus on what you want your MVP to do. Eventually, you can do a future iteration. And it's something that I think people forget is you still can MVP and approach things like this for a new product build on top of an existing service. An MVP, yes, it's this one product. But actually, if you're adding an additional feature, give it this level of scrutiny. Why are you putting your time and money into this and not something else? If you're going to spend 50 grand on developing a feature, is that better than spending 50 grand on people for your sales team or buying a new developer to do what they're doing already better and faster? There's a whole raft of things, and I think people forget that this methodology can still be applied to your existing product and just going through your roadmap and your new features and your business as usual development. And it kind of goes back into what we're saying already of who is it you're actually proving this for? So the next thing we do in our scoping sessions is we go through the users of the system. What are the actors involved in the system? Do we have one user? Is it, and that's your core user type. Is this a marketplace where you've potentially got two users interacting through a journey? When you look at tools like ShareTribe, who are a marketplace as a service tool, They've gone through this journey and they've really identified this. But equally, you might have multiple people interacting at the same time, in which case you need to track what they're doing. And you also need to track where they're actually interacting. And again, going back to revenue and going back to what we need, who's actually paying for this? Because we've had several instances where users of our systems are not actually the people who are paying for this. It may well be this is a tool for developers to use and get the most out of every day, or this is a tool for general employees to use. 
but the value of the system is actually to another user. So how do we demonstrate that value that actually they may be paying? It might only be five pounds a month, but how do we demonstrate to the person who isn't potentially using the system what the value of this has been to them? I use an example of something like Timetastic, which is a tool for uh, tracking holidays. They've gone through extensive iterations and they've done a fantastic job. But the value to it is actually making it easy for your HR team to know who's off, when, how many conflicts there are. And actually comparing that to the user of the system generally going to be your employees. But they're not really seeing a benefit whether they're filling out a form. Yes, it's slightly easier, but it's not the person who's paying for it. So how can you demonstrate that, whether it's general dashboards and just showing how much time you've saved? We've had startups where it's actually we know that we think we can save a particular sector 20% of their time. How can you demonstrate that and how do you make it easier? How do you demonstrate that this is working and worth paying for? And what do they want? Like I said, what do they want out of this? They just want to see people using it. And they just want to feel good about things. And again, going back again back to something we said earlier, what are you doing in all this? So if we start talking about plugging in AIs, for example, is that something you can do manually for the first six, 12 months? If that means rather than needing to put 100 grand into your product, you only need to put 25 because AI is expensive. Is there manual steps you can take that are going to reduce the cost of build, reduce the time of build, and reduce the risk to both yourselves and your team? It's a huge thing to be able to be able to go through that. And understanding your role within the startup and what time you're going to be able to put into all these roles. Because, again, let's face it, as a founder, you're going to wear a lot of hats a lot of the time because whether it's... You, you know, affording to have team members who can do all these things, or whether it's being able to actually, I'm going to be I'm going to a sales call today. I can't send out the invoice today, which means I have to do that tomorrow. I need to block that out, which means I can't be doing sales calls. But again, remember, this is your MVP. If no one said this is going to be easy, if you the more you can do manually, the smaller your build cost, the quicker to market, the quicker you can prove things the quicker you are hopefully getting funding to be able to then automate these steps in the future and then go on to be able to put more time into sales or running your development team or becoming your head of innovation. That's something for future, future things and what your role is even going forward within the startup. And again, how are we going to prove all of this? What's the core journey, your key user, is going to take to achieve their goal. Is this, I want to book a ticket. Think of something like Ticketmaster. I need to find a gig. I need to purchase a ticket. I need to, I need to check out. I don't, want to, I don't want it confirmed. Their actual goal is they want to buy, go to a concert. And, it's, and this is where I think some of the problem versus solution led thinking can come in, which is something we go through when we do the sco actual scoping. But what's the core journey that we're trying to achieve what then needs to go in to support that well actually there might be a case where someone's bought this ticket and they can't turn up so what happens then can they cancel the ticket can they back do they get a refund how does it work what are the systems around that and if it's not supporting that core journey do you really need it it's one of the most crucial questions that we ask in our head of engineering eric who's joins for these scoping sessions he's very good at going through this and actually identifying things where it's this is actually going off on a complete tangent one we're spending time going through this which is fine but how is this going to link back to our core journey goals that we set and our mvp goals and actually can we just put that back and it's not that this isn't a great idea that could generate revenue in the future is this going towards our mvp is this proving your problem solution and actually, we can take that out, and that's something you can go into your roadmap for future development. Like I said, the things need to be tech, can they be manual? And how are you going to test all this? Is this actually we're going to go out on the street, 
And if your aim isn't to generate revenue, is it you're going to talk to people and on, try and onboard them there and then if it's an app, why not? Is this, I'm going to do some Facebook ads and some general SEO and I'm going to try and get a thousand hits a day on my website. Setting your metrics and understanding how you're going to test what's working and what's not is one of the crucial parts of my role. So what, how we develop MVPs is we do it in two stages with both stage being split by a testing phase, which we encourage the actual founders to do themselves. Again, get out the building, go and speak to your users. And we've had it where they've come back and gone, actually, we need to completely rethink this. Or actually, we just need, if the users said, if, if it had this, and that because we're only halfway through development, that's absolutely fine. We can pivot. That's the whole point of being agile. We can move on to different pieces if that's what users think will, or what you think will help users sign up or see the value. We've had it where it's just been all the feedback's been actually, we really love the functionality. It just looks shit. That's fine. We can look at the UI. We can get designers in to provide a more comprehensive UI, but we know the functionality works. And if the only problems are UI, you're in a great place because UI can usually change fairly quickly. But making sure you're testing this properly to get to the right level of feedback. Because if you look at the design sprint by Jake Knapp, they only tested five users. And they think that out of those five tests, they will get 80% of the feedback that they'll get from all users. And it's a great book that I highly recommend people reading. And it's part of this is what we've actually based our process on. Something we've run in the past as well, which is far more UI heavy. But actually doing this is far more dev and far more MVP focused. But again, a book I'd highly recommend people to read who are interested. So we come to the end of the slides and we'll do a QA and a after this. What's really, really important out of all of this? First things first, do your research first. Part of this, and we've, I've covered it briefly, there's a lot of this you can do before you've even touched a keyboard. You can go out to your users, you can get feedback, you can look at what the trends are. We work with people who are at a stage of their business, which is incredibly embryotic. People who have done a bit of research, but might not even have a pitch deck yet. But if you can prove to me that this is a problem worth solving, and actually I've already spoken to 100 users who've said, I don't know, let's say it's a dating app. They hate Tinder. They hate whatever app that they're using at the moment. And this is why they hate it. And here's my solution for it. And I've spoken to them. Or I've created a Wix website, which can actually, and I've got a 1,000 signups for that already. The case for me to then speak to the team and say, I think this is something we should proceed with. It's so easy. It's almost a no-brainer. And that was just with a bit of research. And that's a genuine example. Always remember that this is your MVP. You can always add to it later. You're, once you've eventually got your own development team, you can build whatever you want. Your MVP, if you're, especially if you're using people like ourselves, we want you to succeed. Our Sweat equity model means that we are there to help you and we are always going to be helpful. But make sure that we're building what's core now that can be extended on, iterated, changed. You look at some of our biggest clients we've worked in the past, like Bankify, which is a great startup based, in, based out of Manchester, who've expanded internationally. The MVP is completely changed now and they've built more and more and more features but without that initial mvp you don't get anywhere so always be remember you can always change things development isn't a your mvp is done you don't touch it your version one is done you don't touch it and avoiding things like waterfall practices be involved with your dev team constantly seeing what's being built one of the reasons we have a bigger office than we need is so our founders can come and sit and work with us which means they can talk to our developers. Uh, one of our clients, Co Perceptuo, I saw having a conversation with one of the developers the other day to understand the model better, to be able to then 
better sell that to their new users. It's a huge benefit, but we always focus on the MVP. And you know what? If you do your experiments, if you build something and you test it, you demo it and people don't react to it, that's fine. This is the stage to do that. You can always change things. Going back again, everything can be iterative. Everything can be changed, tweaked, and you can be wrong and go, actually, I had this assumption. I've gone and tested it, which hopefully you won't have done because you've done your research. But actually, you did some research and then having a user there, they've gone through it and they really hesitated and wouldn't press the purchase button. Maybe, and then understanding why they wouldn't is really important. Go, actually, I was wrong. People don't want to pay for it at this point. They really enjoyed it. So why don't you move the, and then ask why. Always go down these five whys, and it might be move your billing system a little bit further forward or move it further back. It can be something rather than per transaction. Maybe the model isn't quite right, and everything can be tweaked as long as you do you experiment and you understand why it worked or why it didn't. And hopefully your research has impacted that. Using low code, I've already mentioned Bubble. We've had users come in a system like Adalo. I've mentioned ShareTribe. All of these things, I'll admit now, I am not a technical person as much as I work at CSF. I'm the only non-technical person, mind. But I can build in these tools. There's a little bit of mindset and there is you know, a rather steep learning curve, but there is nothing stopping you from building stuff in this early. There's several startups who were on the rising stars last year who started with a low-code, no-code system and raised off the back of that. So do you know what? If you can bypass, at least for the start, of needing a development team or even having speed source because it's something you can build yourself, go and do it. It's the cheapest way to fail or the cheapest way to succeed, hopefully. And then eventually when you've gone, I've proved this, I've got a 1,000 paying users, what I actually need to do is I've hit the limits of bubble. I can't build all the little bits I want to. What I want to do is keep Bubble running and have a development team build my version of this. That's fine. and That's great. It's very hard for an investor to say no to a proposition like that when you've already proved it. And obviously there's a migration, you move people across, and then suddenly you've got an extensible platform. But starting in a way which is cheap and easy to use for you know, the average person, why wouldn't you do that? It's a great way of doing research. Build it first and go, actually, I've built this platform. Here's all the steps through it, and here's why they're there. It's also a good way of getting your thinking across because it's actually a way of going, well, actually, I've, I've gone through this flow myself, and this bit didn't work, so I've taken it out and replaced it with this, and this feels better. Treat yourself as a user. A great way of doing your research is to treat yourself as a user. And like I said, then just get, and I've said all the way through, get out the building, get it launched. If you're not proud, if you're proud of your MVP, you've waited too long is a genuinely good quote to remember. I'd write it on the wall at TSF if I could and not get told off of graffitiing. Too many people wait too long or wait for the ideal time. No time is ideal. You'll always be getting feedback on your product, ideally. And if you keep waiting and trying to implement, you'll never launch. And if you never launch, you're never going to get there. Even if it, you don't think it looks great, just get it out. It'll all be okay. You will get your feedback. And if people say, didn't like this and this, that's great. You can go back and iterate on that. But if unless it's launched, you don't get that feedback and you don't know. And let's say that's the feedback aspect. There's a whole raft of things around building your MVP. And in this sort of 30 minute webinar, there's only so much I can cover that we cover in a three to four hour session. But we end up with post-it notes over walls, this discussion, and it's okay to be wrong. And it's okay to challenge our assumptions. One of the things that we're great at at TSF is going, we've worked with hundreds of startups at this point and done hundreds of these sessions. We're good at identifying identifying what minimum is. But this is where we expect our founders to push back and say, this might well be minimum, but we've lost that viability or this doesn't feel like a product anymore. And that's fine. We aren't experts. What we ask our founders to be 
is an expert in their field. We don't expect you to know technology because that's why you come to us. So you tell us what's viable. You tell us based on your research, back it up. So actually our users said they really want this feature. We've suggested, we gave them a list of five things and I'm always happy to help people if they're looking at doing a startup and want to do some user research. I'm always happy to provide feedback on questionnaires, help you to go through feedback and try and identify key trends because actually you do that, it's going to make it a better product. And there should be that tension. This doesn't have to be all happy, clappy, TSF are always right. But it, equally, you're not going to always be right. It's about that mixing of the minds. It's about getting to a stage where we feel that our minimum is about right to to reduce the risk that people that our founders are going through and that we're going through and the investors are going to go through while retaining the viability that we're actually achieving the goal our users want to achieve in a way that's going to be paid for that makes it a product. And that's what your MVP is. And if you can hit those three, great. If you think you're a little bit wrong on one of them, or maybe you've gone too hard on the viability, it's not quite as viable as you thought, that's fine. Add, you can, it's, it's out there and launched, and as long as it works for 80%, you can add in that extra feature to get the last 20%. Or you can add in uh, an extra extra step to be able to work for more of the market or work for a different sector. That's all absolutely fine. And really focusing on that initial user, that initial journey, you're going to get there and your products will be great. So thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Um, I know we've got a little bit of time here. I wanted to leave it for any questions that anyone has. Um, some shameless plugs. Uh, we do have a podcast and we do have some blogs. Uh, a lot of those are focused on MVPs. There's actually a chapter by Eric, who's our head of engineering, around defining your MVP as well. Um, we always have an open door policy. So we're at Manchester Technology Centre. So if you ever want to have a chat about your startup, just come in. We've got a decent coffee machine. We'll always have a chat with you, whether it's myself or another member of the team, whether it's just bouncing ideas off, especially for you solo founders out there. It's a hard life and it can be a very lonely road. If you ever need someone just to talk to or to just bounce an idea off, we're always happy to do that. and We don't charge for anything in terms of our support. And if you are interested in working with TSF, you can apply through the website. We have a form there that will come through to me and I'll, read through it and i'll be getting back to you very soon so thank you very much everyone i shall now open the floor for any questions also if they don't have any questions you want to get in touch with me otherwise uh my email is jamesb at tsf.tech uh yeah thanks for that james Hi, Brian. Just probably just a pretty quick one, but like from our point of view, where we've already got a product that's like pretty well established and we're iterating, adding new features, would you say that like most of this still applies to some extent? I guess there's like a distinction between coming up with the first version of your product to actually release and then like you know, a couple of years down the line. Yeah, 100%. Um, completely get the question. That a lot of this is obviously tailored towards a complete new Greenfield project. I think a lot of the thinking, however, can still be applied to an existing product, that it's something that's very established. Actually, it helps with a lot of this in that you've already got access to your core users. So really what you can use this for is actually defining what your roadmap's going to be. And what, because let's face it, having a development team is very expensive. So you want to make sure that you are using them as effectively and efficiently as possible. So applying that thinking towards your roadmap features means you can you can definitely get to a stage where you've streamlined your roadmap. And with access to users already, you already can already do beta tests and A/B tests to see how that impacts that you how it impacts the flows and how people use it. And you can always do stuff like. Um, you're already paying for this, we'll give you 50% off or we'll do some sort of trial 
and as a thank you you can you'll get this back but i think yeah. the thinking definitely goes into that okay cool thanks anyone else good morning thank thank you for that hi connor hi um do you have any tips for getting traffic to an mvp um, I, th I think when it comes to getting traffic, it really comes down to what your application is or what your platform is. Yeah. Uh, we, as part of what we do at TSF, we actually have a marketing expert in our team who will actually help plan launches. Um, and depending on what it is, so we've worked on things like dating apps, where a more guerrilla approach has seemed more appropriate, looking at what things like other apps out there like Thursday have done or hosting events has always been great for that. Yeah. Uh, equally, you can look at you can actually look at your SEO and Facebook ads can, can do that. But again, if you throughout the process, the more you're focusing on your users and talking to them, that should give you at least the initial channel. It's something I'm more than happy to pick up, and um, I'm sure in the future we'll be doing on how to actually reach your first users because it is something that actually getting the first ten users is much harder than getting your first hundred. <laughs> yeah. I'll definitely yeah. look at something like, a, like, I think Facebook ads you can, or Google ads, you can do fairly cheap and set boundaries to be able to at least limit your marketing spend. Mm -hmm. But I think definitely get, to be honest, getting out there and being very clear on who your target user is should help you actually know where they are and you can just pick up the phone. So we've had it with a platform looking at legal. They were HR platform looking at every sector our advice was actually to focus on legals in a city and then just pick the phone up and ring the top 10 solicitors in Liverpool where they were based. And then in future, you can get then either look at a new sector and go, actually, we're going to look at HR departments or actually I'm going to then pick up the phone and look at the 10 biggest ones in Manchester. So you can approach your launches in a slightly different way depending on what you feel is more comfortable and how big your addressable market is. Yeah. If that Thanks for the question. That. Yeah, yeah. Cheers. Any more for any more? Equally, um, if anyone does want a copy of the book, it is on Amazon, but will just drop me an email and I'll send you one for free. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, with that being the case, if there's no more questions, I say if anyone does want to get in touch, my email's James B at the startupfactory.tech. Thank you very much for your time today and for listening. Uh, I know we've got a few more webinars coming up and I hope you found this useful. But if you've got any questions at all, feel free to drop me a message. Thank you all. And Thanks. I'll hopefully catch you on the next webinar. Thank you.